Fielder is a lecturer at the university. It's still up. I got you nothing. Just pull the, the yeah. Plug out. There you go. Okay. So she's a lecturer at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, in the English department, uh, working on a book called Kinfulness White Womanhood and Interracial Kinship in 19th Century American Literatures, and a new project, Animal Humanism Species, Race, and Humanity in the Long 19th Century. Further ado. Thanks very much, Harlan, for uh, including me, and thanks for putting all of this together. It's been really, uh, really interesting. At the opening of Victor Hugo's novel on the Haitian Revolution, Bug Jargal, the figure who ties the narrative's main white characters to the now deceased titular character, an enslaved African prince who has helped organize the uprising, is an enormous mastiff named Rask. The dog's presence throughout the novel shows how relationships formed across lines of species have different potential than those forged, forged across lines of race in Hugo Saint-Domingue. As Vasque's associations with the various people of the novel shift, he is able to be incorporated into the different societies of the text's human characters. Rask's incorporability is a feature Hugo's human characters do not always have, as their racial or national identities prevent them from so easily shifting positions within Saint-Domingue's complex structures of affiliation. It may initially seem as though Rask's animality removes him from the human structures of affiliation, freeing him to move between racialized and nationalized spaces by virtue of his status as being without race or nation. However, Rask does not appear as a completely deracialized or denationalized figure. Rather, he moves between spaces despite the racial or national affiliations to which Hugo attaches him. In this, Rask's position shows how a dog can become a racialized and nationally affiliated, though depoliticized, figure in Hugo's novel. This essay is from a larger project in which I examine how and why domesticated animals are both racialized and incorporated into structures of human kinship in order to excavate these texts' potential for regarding interracial and interspecies relations in non-derogatory terms. In Bug Jargal, I'm interested in the incorporation of an animal character into familiar and familial domestic spaces that reject the incorporation of the racial other, while still racializing the non-human. In effect, Reading Rask shows what the translation of a non-human character across lines of racial and national affiliation means for rethinking these categories and the effect of kinship relations that are con constituted within and between them. As a racialized figure himself, it is both Rask's status as a non-human and his own creolization, his instantiation in a mixed Caribbean space and his translation across language that allow him to serve as both a mediator of and a participant in effective kinship. Rask's shifting affiliations help mark the framing narrative of Hugo's novel. At its opening, we learn that Sergeant Thaddeus of the French military has just retrieved Rask from the enemy English camp and has himself been injured in the process. While Rask is now understood to belong to de Verny, uh, another French officer, the soldiers uh, talking with him refer to Rask as your lame dog. We learn that he previously belonged to Bug Jargal. Although Bug Jargal has been killed by the French military during the insurrection, he and Duvernay shared an unlikely friendship, which the rest of the novel develops retrospectively. Duvernay's supposed inheritance of the Mastiff of Bug is the remaining marker of the men's kinship. Not just existing in simple parallel to Bug Jargal, Rask holds a more complex position in the text, as he is ultimately able to be incorporated into the familiar, and I would say familial space, of the French regiment, a space that would seemingly reject the incorporation of the racial other. Because Rask is a dog and not a man, he is more seamlessly incorporated into the French military community than the formerly enslaved African man would be. But Jargal's death is not only a tragedy in the story's plot, but a convenience of it. Because he does not live through the uprising, there is no way for his friendship with Daverny to continue, no way for him to reconcile to Thaddeus, no future for him in the world of the story's outer frame. He is preserved and idolized in the memories of the French officers who do not have to contend with the logistical problems of then incorporating their friendship with him into their world. Rask, on the other hand, lives on. The dog's animality depoliticizes him despite his earlier fidelity to protect Bug Jargal from a military execution. His loyalty is transferable from the man whose life he could not save, not only to Duvernay, the man Bug Jargal calls brother, but also to Thaddeus, the officer who shot and wounded Rask in the process of Bug Jargal's execution. But, as Thaddeus reminds us, Rask is not just a dog. When he returns wounded to the French camp, Thaddeus tells his captain that he risked his life and suffered this injury, not for a dog, 
but for Rask. Rask's domestication is not a mark of animalization simply, but rather his fidelity is ascribed to a more human-like virtue. If domestication can be articulated through assumed ownership, this is tricky business in the novel. While we are to understand that de Verny has long ago assumed possession of the dog, Thaddeus can still only refer to him through this earlier relation to the, de to the deceased as the Mastiff of Bug. The permanency of this relation suggests something other than possession or mastery of pet. Because his relation to Rask must be articulated even after Bug Jargal's death, we might better understand this as a relation of kinship, one which extends de Verney's relation to Rask by virtue of his earlier relation to Bug Jargal, as the men each come to call each other brother. Because the French men are now absented from any relationship or affiliation with the dead black man, it may initially seem as though the dog has taken Bug Jargal's place. This is not a simple exchange, however, and the association of Bagdargal to Rask does not amount to Rask simply sliding into his former master's position, nor does it effectively relegate Bagdargal to a position of pet-like fidelity. The transfer of Rask from one man to another does not so much suggest the vicarious post-mortem domestication of, domestic, domestication of Bagdargal then, as it positions a character through which the men's relationship is then mediated. That is to say, Rask's relationship with Bagdargal Daverny and Thaddeus, relationships that mark his own shifting positions of affiliation, facilitates these men's relationship with one another. There seems to be no reason to question Rask's fidelity to Bugjargal. The imprisoned man, though awaiting execution, removes his chains only to feed his dog, who, quote, can eat only out of my hand, and who would have died of hunger had Bugjargal not, Bug not been able to let him out of his cell. Rask stands as a marker of Bugjargal's humanity, and his initial plea for Daverny to do no harm to Rask instantiates his reevaluation of the white man as would be oppressor. As though in repayment for Bugjargal's earlier protection here, when he is later about to be executed, Rask attacks the gunman, Thaddeus. While he succeeds in calling the dog off, we read that, quote, Bugjargal could not stop Rask from going over to lie down at his feet, where he is then wounded by a stray bullet as the man is killed. Rask's later fidelity to de Verny is presented as similarly unquestionable. It has been transferred seamlessly to the French captain with the assumption that Rask understands the bond of kinship that existed between the two men and now regards the other as his own closest relation. Rask is even somehow reconciled to Thaddeus, who he has come to realize his, mis who has come to realize his mistake in executing Bugjargal and whose recovery of Rask from the English camp appears as an attempt at atonement. In the final note of the story, we, we, uh, that follows the frame story's conclusion, we read of the Verney's ultimate death in battle, alongside both Thaddeus and Rask. Kinship in Hugo's novel is constituted by filial affective relations as well as racial and political allegiances. The question of who is a good brother and who is a false brother becomes a point of particular anxiety within the complexity of national racial allegiances during the revolution. But Jargal's and de Verny's effective kinship relation seems to extend to Rask then as he participates in the relation of filial fidelity that permeate Hugo's masculinist plot. Here, we see the similarities between de Verny's respective relations to Bug Jargal, Rask, and Thaddeus. In a way, Rask is made to resemble Thaddeus just as much as he does Bug Jargal. When he arrives back at the French camp, Thaddeus warns his captain, you already have a lame dog, I fear you will end up with a one-armed sergeant as well. While the fidelity of the dog mirrors the fidelity of these men, Rask is exceptional in his ability to be re-articulated in national and racialized terms, which allow his effective relationships to be reconstituted throughout the story. While Bug Jargal's and Daverny's brotherhood lives on only through the former's death, Rask's positions of relationality shift and change throughout the narrative without calling into question his fidelity. As Rask participates in these various relationships, he also undergoes a series of re-articulations, translations by which he is reconstituted in each of his subsequent positions of racial and national affiliation. Under translation, Rask is revealed as a complex figure who does not eschew national and racial affiliations as a non-human, but who is translated across these affiliations by virtue of his domestication, which incorporates him into existing structures of affiliation in both nationally and racially construed spaces of domesticity and effective kinship. Thinking of Rask's shifting positions of relation as the transfer of this character from one set to another suggests a linear change in position. 
If Rask was once the dog of Bugjargal and later becomes the dog of Daverni, these positions seem to be mutually exclusive. However, when we think of Rask's relationship in terms of translation, we're better able to understand how these relations can exist simultaneously, how Rask can belong to or with Daverni in the story's frame, and yet still be referred to as the dog of Bug. In the scene in which Thaddeus describes his recovery of Rask, who has wandered into the English camp, he recounts this ability of Rask to be differently translated by simultaneous attempts to articulate his position of affiliation in literal terms. When Thaddeus finds him in the English camp, he hears the English soldiers call to him, French dog, French dog. Rendered in English, even in Hugo's original text, this translation of Rask foregoes the dog's name and instead renders him by virtue of his belonging to the French camp. Mirroring Thaddeus' early assessment as not a dog, but Rask, we have here not Rask individualized, but a recognition of the dog's origination in the French camp, which also amounts here to an assumption about the dog's nationality. This assumption becomes ironic in light of the dog's earlier origins. Thaddeus marks this uh, misrecognition as a point of humor, commenting, as if your dog weren't a Saint-Domingue dog, born and bred. Unlike de Verny, whose French birth is a point of his self-identification, this dog seems to be a Creole, a designation of, both, of birthplace, which can, be either referred to, which can either refer to blacks or whites in Hugo's novel. The term Creole may be a more suitable association even than Saint-Domingue for Rask, as Creole embodies not only the geographic space, but also the linguistic and cultural amalgamation of this island. If we think of Rask's translata translatability as a kind of creolization, we can better understand his ability to be incorporate different, seemingly exclusive positions of association, belonging, or kinship in the novel. Thaddeus's your in this scene refers to Daverny, of course, and not Bugjargal, marking Rask simultaneously belonging to or with the French captain, while also claiming his identification with Saint-Domingue. Still, despite Thaddeus's understanding of Rask as a Saint-Domingue dog, the Englishman's assessment uh, in the Englishman's assessment, he becomes simply French. Rask's animality allows him to be translated, even if misread into Frenchness, by virtue of this affiliation. Not understood as a being without race or nation, then, Rask's racial and national affiliations are not simply evacuated, but become ambiguous, as his only legible position of identification is attached to the place of his colonial or colonized birth and the languages by which he is interpolated. Despite the nationalized terms by which he's read, which also bear the marks of racialization, Rask is able to traverse the racialized and nationalized spaces of Saint-Domingue, and his relationships with the human characters can be translated across lines that seem to effectively bar humans from viable relations of affective kinship. Rask's translatability seems particular to his animality, while the titular character of Hugo's novel is unable to be incorporated into a French national homosocial domestic space, in Rask, the figure of the dog provides a model of affective relations that eclipsed Averni's or Bugjargal's articulation of brother. 